Hey guys, today we're going to be talking about the plasma membrane. Now I know some of you did the cell membrane when you were looking at your organelle flip grids and it's something we already kind of went over in class. But today I want to spend a little more time focusing on how it's built, the structures that make up that plasma membrane so we can better understand how it functions. Because over the next couple of classes, we're going to be looking at the process of diffusion, facilitated diffusion, active transport, and osmosis. And the way they work in a cell is largely dependent on the actual structure of the plasma membrane. Now, there are some key words that you're going to kind of hear as we go through today. So I'll try and highlight those for you so you make sure that you uh, get something about those in your notes. So let's go over the essential questions. So number one, what does it mean to be selectively permeable? Okay, how does this term describe membranes? And so there's that first word that I really kind of want to highlight for you. What does it mean to be selectively permeable? Okay, selectively permeable. You might be able to figure that out on your own, but we'll talk more about it here in a second. Okay, number two, what is the structure of the plasma membrane and why does this make it efficient at regulating homeostasis? Now, this word we're not going to spend a ton of time on today, but it's going to become one of the central pieces to this whole next section talking about movement within a cell. Uh, we briefly talked about homeostasis when we were talking about characteristics of life. So you may remember that this means, you know, maintaining an internal balance. And then number three, why is the fluid mosaic model a good name for the current membrane model? Now, remember, when we study these things, we, we can take electron micrographs and get pictures and get an idea of how it works. Uh, but all of these things are models. They're representations to help us better visualize how they function, how they do their jobs, and what they look like inside our bodies. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started and take a look at the functions of the membrane. So the functions of the membrane, number one, is to detect and respond to stimuli. Again, you'll remember that this was one of those characteristics of life that we discussed before, is that response to stimuli. And so a large part of that at the cellular level is taken care of by the membranes. Now, the membranes have different attachments to them, carbohydrates, uh, lipids, these types of things to help them respond, and even proteins when we start looking at the functions of how the membrane does this job. Number two, maintain concentrations of various substances by controlling incoming and outgoing materials. This is where that term selectively permeable comes in. We talked before about the idea that a plasma membrane or the cell membrane acts like the bouncer. It's what's regulating what's coming in and what's going out of the cell. Mostly food and water coming in, waste products being eliminated. So selectively permeable means that some things come through and others are kept out. So if you're a selective person, that means you don't just take everything, you'll only take specific things. And that's what the membrane does. It takes what it wants, what it needs, and then it tries to hold at bay those things that don't really belong inside the cell. And number three, its job is to protect the cell. This is especially true when we start looking at animal cells because animal cells don't have a cell wall, if you remember. We have a skeleton that helps us with our uh, structure in terms of our organism. And so we don't rely on a cell level protection in terms of a cell wall for rigidity. So the way we do it is we use our cell membrane to act as that protective barrier between the cell and the external environment. Okay, so when we start looking at a response to the environment, organisms have to detect and respond to stimuli external to them. Now this term stimulus may kind of be familiar, but we want to make sure that you understand what we're saying when we say this. So a stimulus is a signal to which a cell or organism is going to respond. Now it can be a positive stimulus, a negative stimulus. It's simply something that you must react to. This occurs at both the organismal letter level when we start thinking about uh, heat, right? External heat, it's a hot day and your body's gonna sweat when it's a cold day and your body's gonna shiver. Uh, but this can also happen at the cellular level too. We end up with too much water inside the cell. We end up with too much salt outside the cell. What does the body do in these particular instances? 
So at the cellular level, this is largely carried out by proteins that are embedded in the plasma membrane. Yes, just another job of proteins. There are so many of them. Which brings us back to that term we introduced, homeostasis. Now, homeostasis is the process of maintaining balance or equilibrium. So when we start thinking about this, homeo should remind you of the prefix homo, which means same. So homeostasis is the process of maintaining balance or sameness on both sides of the membrane or organism or cell. Okay. Cells must keep proper concentration of nutrients and water coming in to keep the cell fed and hydrated and must eliminate the waste so the cell doesn't become cytotoxic. The plasma membrane is selectively permeable. There's that term again, meaning it allows some things to pass through, the ones it wants, while blocking other things that it shouldn't have internally. Now, we have so much more technology than when they first discovered these things, so we're able to actually get a pretty good idea of what they kind of look like. Now, this is an interesting micrograph. This is a, a capture taken by an electron microscope so that you can actually see the membranes. Now, if you go ahead and take a look, this is interesting because the membrane itself actually has two parts. So there's one part right here, and then there's the other part right here. You can actually see the two different lines. Same thing here. There's one right here, and there's one right here. This is going to be a really important feature of the plasma membrane. This is what's known as a lipid bilayer. Okay, and remember bi, meaning that there are two of them. Okay. So it's a lipid bilayer, but you'll also notice that there's a gap in between. When we go ahead and start looking at this gap, this gap is where a lot of the communication occurs between cells. The cells that you're looking at here are nerve cells. And so this in particular is a really important place where you have communication signals, mostly in terms of, of chemicals, uh, proteins being sent back and forth between the two different cells, okay? All right, so let's take a closer look at the actual structure of the membrane. Now, as I just mentioned, it's a lipid bilayer. Again, there are two sheets of lipids. And what type of lipid, if you remember all the different classes we talked about in our lipid notes, are what we call phospholipids, okay? And we find these plasma membranes located around the outside of the cell, the cell membrane. It's the only plasma membrane that all cells have but we also find them around the nucleus. If you remember the nuclear membrane or nuclear envelope, it makes up the outer shell of the vacuole. It makes up all the infolding parts of the mitochondria and the little stacks that we'll talk more about later in terms of the thylakoids for the chloroplasts. So it's found in many different organelles. You can find it in the endoplasmic reticulum. You can find it in the Golgi body, okay? All of these, are what we call membrane-bound organelles. That means that the outer layer is a membrane, like we're talking about today. Most of these membranes are going to be embedded with proteins and strengthened with cholesterol molecules. Yes, you heard that right. Cholesterol. While most of us think about cholesterol as something that's bad, there is actually an important function of cholesterol inside your body. And that is to help with the strengthening of this membrane structure and give it some fluidity when you start having things like temperature changes. So what's a phospholipid? This is an idea of a phospholipid. Now here it's a bilayer. So when we go ahead and look at it, this, not the best drawing ever, is one phospholipid. So you can see here, we've got two on this side, one, two on this side. So they're always gonna match up. And what they have in terms of their structure is a head, which you can see right here, and then two fatty acid tails, one, two, okay? So it's a pair of fatty acid chains, two fatty acid chains, and a phosphate glycerol head attached at the top. Now, this is an important structure when we go ahead and start looking at it. 
because when we go ahead and look at this lipid bilayer, this orientation of the structures plays an important role. You'll notice that the tails are inside here and the tails are inside here. Now, when we go ahead and take a look at these, the tails are what we call nonpolar. Do you guys remember the term polar that we talked about earlier? Okay, yeah, that's right, when we were talking about water. So water is a polar molecule. And if you remember, 70% of your body approximately is made up of water. Well, it turns out that they have the nonpolar region inside the membrane bilayer, but outside is polar on both sides and inside the cell is polar. So you have this polar, likes to be around water. You have nonpolar, doesn't like to be around water. And you have polar again. You can try some of this when you go ahead and just play in the kitchen. If you get yourself a cup of water and then go ahead and pour on top of it some vegetable oil, for example, what happens? If you said that they separate, you're right. They don't like to be around each other because the vegetable oil is nonpolar versus the water once again being polar. Like things, polar things like to be together. Like things, nonpolar things like to be together. And so you see this orientation creating the barrier between the inside and outside of the cell. Now, the term that they typically use when looking at this is what we call hydrophilic. If you know that ending, philia, right? Um, I would be what you consider an audiophile, somebody who loves music, okay? So hydrophilic means water liking. These are going to be molecules that like to be around water. The polar heads, right, the phosphate glycerol head, likes to be around water. On the other end, however, you have your hydrophobic, you think like arachnophobia, uh, fear of or water fearing, which try to avoid water. These are the nonpolar tails, and that's why the tails orient together and the heads are on the outside next to where the water is. Now, this is a great structure to prevent things from passing through, but with something that tight, nothing's going to go through except the smallest of molecules. Things like oxygen, carbon dioxide, water, they can fit through the membrane itself. But for larger things, if we need to get sugars in, we need to go ahead and get other carbs or proteins or any charged molecule like a sodium or chlorine ion, we need help. And that help comes in the form of embedded membrane proteins. So these are largely responsible for what other types of materials can pass through the membrane. Many of them serve as enzymes, which if you remember, enzymes are types of proteins that speed up chemical reactions by lowering the necessary activation energy. They also act as markers that help materials get figure out where they are and where they need to go to get inside or outside of the cell. This is especially true when we start using them for the immune system to help us recognize warning signs and to attack a particular cell that may be sick or need to be destroyed to prevent the spread of disease. Okay, now I've created some little graphics using paint here. Um, so bear with me a little bit, but I think they're pretty good at doing a job of demonstrating what it is we're talking about here. So what you're looking at here is a cell and a cell membrane. So on the inside here, so remember this is the inside and this is the outside. You've got a lipid bilayer, okay? So here is one layer and on the other side, you've got your other layer, okay? One two, that's a lipid bilayer. Notice once again that the heads are all on the outside next to where you're going to find the water. Okay, so I'll even put water out here to remind you. My best handwriting using a mouse. And then internal here, we have the phospholipid fatty acids. And so these fatty acids, remember, are nonpolar and they don't like to be around water. You have your cholesterols embedded into the membrane here. You also have your proteins, some that go all the way through what we're going to call intrinsic proteins or integral. And then you also have your superficial or surface proteins, also known as extrinsic proteins. 
proteins that are only on one side of the membrane. Attached to that, you've got other carbohydrates and lipid groups. They're going to help act as warning signs or flag posts. Uh, if you've ever driven down 99 and you've seen some of those car lots that have the little inflatable people outside that are kind of flapping in the wind, these carbohydrate chains do something similar to that to help flag things so that they know where to go. They're like, this is where this protein is. If you need this protein to pass through, come here. So that's the kind of thing that we're looking at. Okay. Now, if you don't like my paint drawings, I'm not offended. Here's an actual one from a textbook showing the same sort of thing. Notice the same highlighted pieces from the previous one. Okay, we've got one layer here. You've got one layer here. So again, lipid bilayer. You've got your cholesterols embedded here that give it that stability and fluidity. You've got your proteins, some of which are extrinsic or on one side, and some that are intrinsic and go all the way through. Okay, for those of you who had the cytoskeleton as your organelle in the previous section, the cytoskeleton is those filaments of protein that are attached on the internal surface of the membrane that help give the animal cell in particular its shape. Okay. Again, here's your carbohydrates. You may find some lipids, glycolipids, for example, that help as acting as kind of some flags or um, road signs so that things know where to go. All right, so what kind of things have membranes? We already talked about this briefly, but let's go over it once more time. So the nucleus has a membrane. It's called the nuclear membrane. The mitochondria, the chloroplast, endoplasmic reticulum, Golgi body, vacuoles, and lysosomes. All of these organelles are bound within membranes. In fact, we have one membrane system made up of a couple of these that kind of runs together. Within the eukaryotic cell, we have what's known as the endomembrane system. It's in a functional association between several of these membrane-bound organelles that kind of work together to build, store, and transfer biomolecules, specifically proteins. So you start out with the endoplasmic reticulum. Inside, around the nucleus, you have the rough ER. And the rough ER, remember, is studded with these tiny little things known as ribosomes. Do you guys remember what ribosomes do? That's right ribosomes go ahead and build proteins. Now those proteins are going to go ahead and travel through the rough ER being modified so that they can be used in different parts of the cell or even outside of the cell. From the rough ER they then move on to the smooth ER and eventually to the Golgi body where they may be packaged in some sort of uh, liposome to be shipped through the cell membrane and out into the rest of the body to a different cell or a different location in the organism. So these three, the rough ER, smooth ER, and Golgi body work together as a team to transport materials around inside. And if you're dealing with the Golgi body, also shipping stuff outside of the cell. One of the things we'll talk about a little later, we're gonna focus on uh, transport within the cell first, is energy production. Now, all green plants have chloroplasts, and these serve as the location for photosynthesis, which we'll talk about in a later week. Chloroplasts are enclosed in a double membrane system that creates a fluid-filled compartment between the membranes. There are two parts that we're gonna talk about later. Don't feel like you have to know all this now. We'll talk about it when we get to photosynthesis. But you have these little flattened sacs called thylakoids, and they are surrounded by a fluid known as the stroma. Okay, so thylakoids in the stroma, all contained within membrane that makes up the chloroplast. The thylakoid membrane greatly increases the surface area for chemical reactions that allows the machinery of the chloroplast to manufacture sugars during the process of photosynthesis. And while you don't have a chloroplast in you, you do have a mitochondria. Now the mitochondria does the other half or the flip side of this reaction. So if the chloroplast is photosynthesis, the mitochondria does respiration. And this converts the chemical energy in the food molecules you eat, such as carbohydrates, sugars, into high energy compounds such as ATP that will power our body's processes. 
So similar to chloroplasts, the mitochondria is enclosed by a double membrane system with a fluid filled, what they call inner membrane space. Again, you don't need to know all this right now. I'm just introducing it to you now for when we go ahead and get further on, start looking at cellular respiration. Second compartment, the mitochondrial matrix, is contained by a highly folded inner membrane. Again, increasing our surface area to have more enzymes that can carry out more reactions to turn your food into this ATP energy molecule that your body relies on to eat. Okay, so that's really the notes for today. Your assignment for today is to go ahead and do a drawing of what is called the fluid mosaic model of the membrane. Now, I want you to think about that term, fluid mosaic. What does that mean, fluid? Moving, right? Okay, mosaic. What does mosaic mean? If you've ever made a mosaic in uh, art class or ceramics, a mosaic, remember, is made up of a bunch of tiny pieces that work together to make the big picture. So the fluid mosaic is working together as a whole, but it's flexible, it moves. So what I'd like you to go ahead and do is draw this, and I've attached it to the assignment, or something similar to this, or create a model that represents what you see here, and then color code or label the parts of the membrane. The terms are down here at the bottom, and again, they're attached to that actual structure, but we need to think about that in term of what, terms of what we've seen in the notes, okay? Again, remember one, two, that's your lipid bilayer. That's made up of two parts. We've got the glycerol head and your fatty acid tails. Embedded inside that membrane right here is your cholesterol, which gives it some stability and fluidity. And then you've got your proteins. You've got your intrinsic proteins, which go all the way through. And you've also got your extrinsic proteins, which are only on one side. Okay, then you're going to go ahead and have your uh, what they call carbohydrates up here that are going to act as kind of your flags. Maybe you look at some glycolipids up there. If this was a glycolipid, which this one probably is because it's attached to this protein here, that would make this a glycoprotein. This would more likely be a carbohydrate. These are your filaments of the cytoskeleton, and those are the kind of structures that we showed you inside this presentation. So now you're done with the notes. So let's go ahead and move off and work on our drawing. We'll come back and talk a little bit more about this structure as we start going through on diffusion, osmosis, facilitated diffusion, active transport, and begin to think about how homeostasis is regulated at the cellular level. All right, guys, great job today. I hope you're doing well. I'll talk to you again soon. Take care of yourself. Bye-bye.